Good evening. I'm Laura Frank. I'm the president and general manager of news at Rocky Mountain PBS. And what did you think of that? And you know, that is just a sample of a 10-part, 18-hour series. And you'll be able to see the entirety of it on Rocky Mountain PBS starting September 17th. Um, I want to welcome you all here before I bring out Ken Burns and General McPeak. I want to just share a little bit about how the rest of the evening will go. Um, we're going to have a conversation here, and at the end of it, we're going to invite you to join the conversation. There are two microphones here in the front of the house, and so we'll invite you up um, so that your questions can be heard by the entire group. And we also have um, groups of people in Colorado Springs and Grand Junction who are joining us uh, via streaming. Wonderful technology, right? And we'll be getting the, some questions from them as well. So I, I would say if I had personally invited each one of you, I might have called you up and said, I would like you to come and see a film that talks about um, ongoing asymmetrical war, uh, a White House obsessed with leaks, a huge document leak, um, mass demonstrations across the nation, and concern about reaching out to a foreign government during a, a national election. And you would have come and been surprised to know that I was talking about a film from Vietnam, about Vietnam 50 years ago. There are so many things that, that resonate today. And that's what I would like to um, talk with, with Ken and General McPeak about. Um, I think we'll go ahead and bring them out. Please welcome Ken Burns and General Merrill McPeak. Um, they need no introduction, but I'm just going to give a little bit of that. Um, the outline areas have just joined us, uh, caught up in the, um, in the streaming. And so, uh, Ken Burns, America's premier filmmaker, storyteller, documentarian, thank you for joining us tonight. Thank you for bringing this amazing work that you and Lynn have done. We really appreciate you being here with us. And General Merrill McPeak, who at one point, of, as you heard, was the Air Force Chief of Staff and a fighter pilot in Vietnam. He flew 256 combat missions in that war and was <laughs> instrumental in helping Ken bring this story to us. Thank you, General. Um, I, I'd like to start We've been, we've spent some time in 1969 tonight. I'd like to bring us before we come to the present to pause a minute in 1989. And I'm going to quote George H.W. Bush in his inaugural address in 1989, talking about divisiveness in, in Congress and in our political system and across our country. He said, we've seen the hard looks and heard the statements in which not each other's ideas are challenged, but each other's motives. It has been this way since Vietnam. This is a fact. The final lesson of Vietnam is that no great nation can long afford to be sundered by a memory. Those words resonate, I think, today as, as much as they did in 1989 um, Ken, are we still divided by the memory of Vietnam? I, I think very much so. Um, you know, we, we have to temper this. I made a film about the Civil War, which was where things really broke down and that civil discourse ended and, you know, 750,000 Americans died o over the issue. Um, 
it's said that you that wars are fought twice, once on the battlefield and and the and the other time in memory. And I think because of the things that I said at the beginning, that a good deal of what we haven't really discussed about Vietnam has been left to to fester. And I think we can feel that the seeds of that discontent manifest themselves today. You know, you quoted me in your opening remarks about all the ways, and there are dozens of other ways that it resonates. Now, we, we tend to say that history repeats itself or that we're condemned to repeat what we don't remember. I, I don't believe that. Mark Twain is supposed to have said that, that history doesn't repeat itself, but it rhymes. And uh, I like that. Um, and I think we've spent a long time l listening to the rhymes. That's what you look for, the patterns and the motifs. Human nature remains the same. That's the clear thing. And it superimposes itself over stuff that happened. And I think then it's then that we perceive that. And so we have a moment, perhaps with Vietnam, which has so much unfinished business for so many Americans uh, from all different perspectives. And we tried so hard in this film to make sure that we honored all the perspectives uh, that were there, that we didn't sort of, in a knee-jerk fashion, make anybody wrong. When somebody did something well, we said that it was well, and we let the record of the other side speak for itself. Um, that we have an opportunity to maybe uh, begin to, to repair that which President Bush uh, understood very, very well. That, that you know, I'm, I'm very fond of um, the first Republican president, uh, Abraham Lincoln. And when he was a, um, a young man, uh, not even 29 years old, he was addressing the Young Men's Lyceum in Springfield, Illinois. And the topic that day was foreign policy, and he said, whence shall we expect the approach of danger? Shall some transatlantic giant step the earth and crush us at a blow? And he answered his own question, never. All the armies of Europe, Asia, and Africa could not by force take a drink from the Ohio River or make a track in the Blue Ridge in the trial of a thousand years. If destruction be our lot, we must ourselves be its author and finisher. As a nation of free men, we will live through all time or die by suicide. That's our challenge. That is our challenge. Is it? That's our challenge. <laughs> General McPeak, what, you, you remained in the military. You have had a, a long and distinguished career. You've had a lot of time to think about the lessons of Vietnam. What, what do you think we should be taking away today? That's just a light question to easy. start us off. I'm a war veteran. Can't you throw up a nice softball here to... <laughs> Thank you for your service. Let me hit it out of the park. <laughs> yes. I can't improve on Ken Burns, first of all. So. I don't know, you probably know Ken, who said, if you can remember the 60s, you weren't there. <laughs> Was it Dick Gregory or somebody? Yes. But, uh, look, I was a... A professional. When I got to Vietnam, I was 33 years old. A major unit commander, I commanded them, Misty uh, Ford Air Controllers. And uh, just a professional. I mean, I came off of two years flying with the Thunderbirds, which was more dangerous than Vietnam. I, I jumped out of an airplane in Del Rio, Texas, in the middle of an airship. Never, that never happened to me in Vietnam. <laughs> so uh, my take on it was. Uh, not at the ethical, philosophical, uh, policy level, although here in the uh, clip that Ken played, I claim we were fighting on the wrong side because I thought those guys we were killing were pretty tough. Uh, as a professional, we came away from Vietnam determined to improve our performance. We bloomed big on North Vietnamese radars. So we invented stealthy airplanes. We didn't have a very good exchange ratio against Northern MiGs, something like one to one, which is pitiful. So we invented training programs. We couldn't hit what we were aiming at, so we developed precision guided munitions. We were ineffective at night. Now nobody wants to fight us at night. Actually, nobody wants to fight us in the daytime either, but they'd rather fight us in the daytime where the, our advantage is less than it is at night because of night systems we've developed. 
So the lessons we learned out of Vietnam from a professional standpoint were uh, effective and applied and we became the most formidable military in the world and when I was chief we fought Desert Storm and it took 44 days and I lost 22 people, something like that. About one airman every two days in very intensive combat. So we learned our professional lessons, but did we learn much at the political and policy level? I'm not so sure. You said in the clip that we saw that, um, that we were fighting on the wrong side. That's a pretty strong statement. What kind of reaction have you gotten to that? I've lost uh, some of my few remaining friends on uh... <laughs> Now look, everybody who uh, had 20-20 vision in Vietnam saw what the problem was. Uh, and it's one we all understand, basically. In the North, you had an iconic figure, maybe not in charge, as Ken has now instructed us, but nevertheless, the right kind of figurehead to lead what amounted to a national movement to reunify his own country. Well, we understand that. We fought a civil war to do that. And uh, also, he fought a war against imperial domination in Southeast Asia. We understand that. We fought a revolutionary war about that. And for us to come in, as we did, to try to support a corrupt regime in Saigon immediately undercut the Saigon government's legitimacy because everyone saw that another outside imperial power was coming in to prop up a, a weak uh, government. So I knew that. Everybody in the squadron who was voting age knew that. We all could see it. We were professionals and we went and did what, we, what the president told us to do. But that didn't blind us to the overarching political realities here that, that essentially this was a war we probably couldn't win. You, you talked in the clips about um, fake metrics and uh, targets that were essentially useless. How did you process that then? And do you look at it differently at all today? Well, <clears throat> look. <laughs> Uh, when you're a gunfighter, you go, you're in the gunfighting business. So, uh, but it's really true that we bombed so many useless targets, we at one point ran out of bombs. It was a, a scandal in Washington that we were launching sorties that were, weren't fully loaded with weaponry because we were just, uh, you know, throwing away munitions on, on nugatory targets. So, but, we did what we were told to do. Uh, the lesson is for, is for everybody to learn there, not just military professionals, but the citizens of the country. You have to cross your fingers and hope you elect uh, common sense uh, adults uh, to political posts. And, uh, <laughs> And, it, and even then, it's a 50-50 shot, right? Ken, you have, have now done a number of, of documentary series on our most important wars. Um, how did this series about Vietnam change your view of the war itself in particular or war in, in general? How has this changed you in these last 10 years that you've been working on this? I, I really don't recognize the person that began this um, project. You're a lot older for one. Yeah, I'm a lot older. Um, and the person I am now, I, I don't, somewhere in the first leg of this 10-year around the world trip, I lost all my baggage about it. I remember the arrogance that I had that this was uh, finally something I knew about and understood almost immediately how little I knew about it and how much scholarship obliterated even what I thought was the, the facts. And that kind of daily humiliation was actually very, very helpful. And one of the things we wanted to do, we didn't have an agenda, we didn't have a political ax to grind, we weren't trying to sort of put our thumb on the scale. And what we did is we learned from the people we spoke to, we learned from our advisors, 
uh, a fundamental thing. You know, in, in the editing room for filmmakers, uh, when a scene is working and somebody tells you, well, it actually didn't, it's complicated. You kind of go, grr. You don't want to, you don't want to mess with something. This is the first project in which we learn to welcome that and to, to really just bring in the complication and, and spend a lot of time removing things. We, we tend to think of the, the creation of a film as a kind of additive pro process, and it is to some extent, but it is more a, a subtractive one, pulling away stuff, the scaffolding and false work that you needed initially for the building to stand, and you don't need it anymore. So we found ourselves removing adjectives and adverbs a lot at the very end and allowing things to speak for themselves and more importantly to allow as many different points of view to obtain as we could possibly do. So we weren't making any money wrong but we we're also inviting every possible uh, perspective and and I think what's important as you can see the Vietnamese voices do an interesting thing. They offer a different point of view of course and, and that's interesting but I think more often than not they triangulate. You know, triangulation is you, you gain perspective when you leave something, you hopefully have some wisdom about it, scholarship permits you to connect some dots that weren't always made by journalism, but I think here triangulation allows you to fix an event more precisely because you have so many different perspectives and yet permit those perspectives to obtain. So, I mean, I've never had a more challenging and therefore more satisfying uh, production to work on. I know Lynn feels the same way. It was a real struggle. It was very, very hard. Uh, but, you know, with General McPeak and, and Jim Wellbanks and others who advised us, we just, we had our own education. Rather than coming in and saying what we knew, telling people what they should know, which the last time I checked is called homework, um, we would rather share with you a process of discovery which is, of course, in the case of this war, joyous at times, tragic at times, but more often than not, it's just complicated. And, and that's really, at the end of the day, it's really, really complicated. And if you think you know, you don't know. And there's lots of stuff that we can't tie up in a ni nice, neat bow. Uh, this is, this is a, a, a narrative operating on many different levels, kind of a complicated epic novel with primary and secondary and tertiary characters and, and cameos that appear, um, and I, not just the talking heads, but historical figures as well. But there's no, there's no one answer and there's no did, one truth. Did you discover during the process surprising similarities between Vietnam and the other wars that you have you know, documented? You know, it's what they say about unhappy families, you know. Um, all wars are the same. All wars are the same. And, and yet they have this terrifying uniqueness to them in their own way. And it's been true since the Greeks have been writing about that and, and back, I assume, before recorded history. And yet what you find are dynamics singular to that to that war but mostly it's the same i mean the process of working on this it, it doesn't feel that different than working on the the civil war or world war 2 or more to the point on baseball or jazz the way you synthesize material the way you distill narrative the way you try to do top down with bottom up and all the different ways that you do it. It's just about war, which is, is, is a fundamentally more revealing activity than almost anything else that human beings do. Obviously in the bad ways, man's inhumanity to man, but all of that is pretty superficial to some extraordinary things that come off. The free electrons given off by human beings in war is incredibly instructive not just in horrific ways, but in really great ways. I mean, and this film is also about, you know, cruelty and mercy, as the introduction says, but it's about love and fellowship and sacrifice. And, and you begin to understand, particularly with Vietnam, that, that courage and bravery doesn't always happen on, on a battlefield. And that was important to, to figure out how to honor and, and, and at least put in a, in a perspective with the, the bravery that we think uh, takes place on, on the battlefield or in the air. General, how was it for you to revisit this? Because you started out, you told me backstage, Ken called you up and said, hey, can we interview you? So you gave him an interview, and then you spent five years 
working with him. <laughs> That's a long interview. Yeah, I got hooked. <laughs> <laughs> couldn't, couldn't throw the hook out. Uh, I just, Ken, just got to say, this film is a masterpiece. And it has a timeless quality about it that makes me think a century from now it'll be watched by people who want to know about the Vietnam War. And I never asked you, you only do wars that are finished, right? Civil War, <laughs> World War II, <laughs> right. Vietnam. Yeah, so, so, so you haven't done Korea because, as we see today, it's not over it's yet. It's not over yet, <laughs> right. And, and the same we know, with World we, War I. If you look at the Middle East, uh, you know, World I, War I's I, not over yet. We are going to tackle, uh, in the next decade, the American Revolution. Um, because that's not over either. <laughs> and, uh, the, 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 clearly, the Civil War is done. No one's fighting that. And, and World War II, you know, there's nothing Nazi about anything going on right now. Well, I, I, <laughs> um, I think it's brilliant to concentrate on the wars that are over. Yes, exactly. I, um, I'm getting texts from Grand Junction and Colorado Springs. I'm supposed to wait until the question and answer, but I've just gotten one from Terry Kraft in Grand Junction, who wants to ask Ken, and, and it fits right in with what we're saying, so I'm gonna ask it now. What series that you've done took the largest emotional toll on you? Oh, this one, this one. Why? I, I think it's because it's um, something I supposedly lived through and clearly didn't and that I had to have all of my molecules rearranged working on it, which is incredibly exciting as well as humbling. And because I think that so much of what, what's going on today had, as we've been saying over and over again, it's, it's sort of roots in Vietnam and, and these things have metastasized to that dangerous level that President Bush was speaking about. And I, I think maybe the metastasis might not be as good an example or good as metaphor as maybe a virus that, you know, the, the, the vaccine is, of course, a little bit of the, of the disease that then prompts your body to learn how to fight that disease. And I think that maybe talking about Vietnam and having um, the kind of conversations about what actually went on. I found most people are embedded in, in their certainty about what they think happened and in their hardened silos of, of resistance and, and, and for lots of very understandable reasons. Um, but I think that if we get out of it, it might be possible to, to sort of remind ourselves that, that, that the danger to our republic does not come from these foreign enemies as much as it comes from ourselves and our inability, you know, to, to figure out how to have that civil discourse to be the author and finisher, as Lincoln said, of our own national suicide. You, um, do you think, uh, we Americans kind of like staying in our silos, and I think probably a lot of folks here and... and well, can, can I, I just say something? Yes, you know, please. I asked Shelby Foote why the Civil War came, and he says, you know, Americans like to think of themselves as uncompromising people, but our genius is for compromise, and when that broke down, we murdered each other. <laughs> so actually, you know, as much as we think I'm standing up for what I believe, the, the forward progress of the United States has all been based on people taking what George Will calls the politics of the half loaf. If you're getting the whole loaf, something's really wrong, right? It ought to be a compromise, and yet that's become a dirty word, uh, both in our, in our political scheme. It's very easy to blame our politicians. It also happens in our own lives, where we're all in a media culture kind of addicted to a binary thing that is absolutely certain that it's yes or no, when in fact there's huge gradations, you know. Um, it's, it's, it's going to be a complicated dilemma for us to work out of, and the only way to do it is to give up. There was a recent study that involved some researchers at the University of Colorado, I think I can mention that here at the University of Denver, um, that talked about how when people had a, a thin understanding of an important issue, they tend to, to be more polarized That's in great. their opinion about it. Do you think people are, is that why this is 18 hours long, so that we can come out of, of this with a little bit deeper understanding that maybe, it's, because, I mean, the point of, of the quote 
quote that I started us out with in this conversation was that people are still standing on their sides about yeah, this no, 20 years after and now 50 years after. Ju judge Learned Hand, and I would suggest that there's no better name for a jurist than Learned Hand in the history of the United States said that liberty is never being too sure you're right. And I think that what we all have about almost everything is a kind of superficial knowledge, a kind of conventional wisdom that doesn't serve us very well to get out of those tough silos. And, you know, I've, I, you know when I say the 20s to somebody, I, you immediately you'll think of something, and it might be a, a flapper or a gangster or a revenue or busting up a, 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 a cask of whiskey. I've been through the 20s on 10 films, and it's always different. And it's always much more interesting and complicated. And I would suggest that even I mean, what I what I was particularly impressed with in in the meetings that we have all the time, we don't bring in our advisors to sort of ratify a fine cut. They're there in the earliest script discussions, even treatment things, and all the way through is that many of the scholars that we use, more than two dozen, all would say, I had no idea about stuff that was outside of their purview. And the veterans said that to us over and over again. And that was exciting, that we tend to think we know about something and, and we may not. And I still feel as if there's so much more to this to learn. It wasn't that it was 18 hours because we had this lesson for you to take home. It was that in order to tell a story and honor the bad, I, I spoke to a, um, two, I had two wonderful conversations before. One with somebody who said, you know, I, I, every history of Vietnam is a political history. It's not what happened. It's not the story of the battles. That's why I made the Civil War series, because everybody would like to talk about, you know, the causes and then the effects. But if you were curious about the battles, they'd say, oh, go talk to old professor so-and-so, emphasis on old, as if somehow a concern about what took place on July 1st, 2nd, and 3rd in South Central Pennsylvania in 1863 was besides the point of causes and effects. I disagreed, and I felt that the same thing here with Vietnam. People had lots of opinions, right or wrong, about what it was, and lots of opinions about this, but very little knowledge of the battles that take place. And you'll learn about Atbac and Bin Ja and your Drang Valley. Maybe some people know about that in addition to the caissons and the Tet Offensives, and dozens of other things that we think are, are important to understanding what went on and human lives that were expended quite apart from having political discussions. They're there, you can, they're in the film, but they're, as you saw with a, you know, one of many, many, more than a dozen uh, scenes about the anti-war movement, balanced, you know? Okay. It begins with Reagan and ends with Nixon, you know, talking about it, rebounding spectacularly from these mass demonstrations all across the country. Yeah. Um, we're clearly in flow because I keep getting questions that are right in line with what, are you say what you're saying. Colorado Springs' Sam Ebersole says, how does McNamara's version of events square with your research? Yeah. Uh, well, you know, it's which McNamara do you wish? He doesn't right? say. He doesn't so, say. Um, you know, we know from the Pentagon Papers, mm -hmm. you brought up, uh, quoting me, the, the big document drop, um, that McNamara had doubts from the very, very beginning and expressed those doubts in private mem memoranda to the president. And these were doubts that were expressed in Truman administration and um, and Eisenhower administration, and Kennedy administration, and no more so than in Johnson and Nixon, but the public was told something else. The reason why, I mean, you can take the Tet Offensive, which had occurred in dozens and scores and scores of places around Vietnam, and every single one was a defeat for the North Vietnamese and the Viet Cong, every single one, and they mostly lasted a few hours or a day, or in the case of Saigon, a couple of days, but only in Hue did it go on for more than three and a half weeks. Uh, but even then, it was a stunning, just humiliating defeat People surrendered, which had never happened before. Um, but you don't hear much about that, except in our film, because it was a big public relations mm -hmm. disaster, because mm -hmm. we had been saying things positively about what was going on in Vietnam, and this seemed to belie that. And so I, I think you've got to ask, what, what, which of McNamara do you want? 
you know? Well, I, I can tell that there are a lot of questions that are coming in, so I'm going to invite anyone in this audience who would like to ask a question to please come up to the microphone. And, and could, I, could, I, could I ask something before please that happens? Go ahead. Could I ask people who served in Vietnam to stand up and those people who opposed the war and actively participated against it to stand up at the same time? Because if we're going to get this country together, we're going to have to realize that there are two sides of a coin. So please let us honor your own commitment to whatever your beliefs were. Is, is standing. Thank you. May we start over here with your question, ma'am. Please go ahead. Uh, if you would say your name uh, and then ask your question. If you can keep them short, we'll try to get as many as possible. Lightning Pretend you're tweeting them to me. Lightning round. <laughs> yes, lightning round. I'll try to be short. Um, Ken, I really, I'm hard of hearing. I really appreciate when you put that right next to your mouth, too. <laughs> okay. I'm having trouble. <laughs> uh, anyway, I, I'm uh, Judy Danielson. Um, I volunteered, or I worked with a religious organization in Vietnam as a physical therapist with civilian Vietnamese during the war. Uh, people who were amputees, uh, children with terrible polio. Um, I, uh, like almost, or many of the civilian volunteers there, uh, spoke Vietnamese. We were the only ones except for the CIA. No, Vietnam, no American government people spoke it and when they tried they made fun of fools of themselves. But um, I knew many, uh, I was there for two years, I knew many Vietnamese students who knew not only their history very well but my history of the United States much better than I did. Um, in, uh, I don't know if you cover the early part of uh, the history, 1954, when the U.S. really was Okay, shut the doors. We're going to show the whole thing. Because <laughs> the thing is, yeah. we'll have an endless, do you do okay. this and yeah. do this. But yes, we still need to answer your questions short. You call this a civil war, but it was really the U.S. that created this civil war, like we do in many other countries, like Iraq. But um, this was the context of a cold war, and Vietnam was the the... Uh, guinea pig, this tiny country where the U.S. and the Soviet Union were it was in a, it was It was a proxy war, and, but it it's complicated. It's complicated. And, uh, and many times I think that is true right now. So I'm very interested in what's going on now. And uh, these Vietnamese people were so patriotic. As General McPeak said, we, we dropped everything we had on that tiny country, and we lost because they, it was their country. They loved their country. They were never gonna give up their country. And I think that's true of every other country we're involved in right now. And we should um, really, why are we doing this well, to these you know, other let, small countries? Uh, uh, and uh, what do you think the lessons are for now and all the countries the U.S. is invading? Well, I, I, I think Thank General, General McPeak that. answered the lessons question, but uh, you know, we'll introduce you to a lot of South Vietnamese soldiers who fought as bravely as anybody that I've ever met, and they've been denigrated. We, we, we remember this is the story of three countries, and then there were two, and it is a very complicated um, um, story that defies the easy binary categorization that anybody makes. Um, Do you have a question over here? Yes. It's hard to say, it's hard to know what to say after that incredible series of clips, Ken. But that statement at the top of the screen is definitely true. I'm sure there are a lot of Vietnam veterans here, and I'm one of them. I volunteered to go to Vietnam in 1967 because we were told that we were going over there to save the country and all of Southeast Asia from communism. Well, we left there without succeeding in that effort, and just yesterday there was an article in the New York Times that the title was, Why Vietnam Was Unwinnable. And there are a number of reasons, but one of them is what General McPeace said, that the government was corrupt 
and consequently we didn't have the support of the majority of the people. But uh, we left and the people that are there now, from what I've seen and heard, they seem pretty happy and content with the government that they have. Uh, was that your experience? No. Um, I, I haven't been there, but my colleagues have been there many, many times and done the interviews. I had a medical reason that still galls me to this day why I couldn't do and uh, participate in some of the interviews. But it is a repressive communist regime. Um, there are people who make statements in our film uh, that were very concerned that making those statements would get them into trouble and a few of the people in the film represent, some of them you've met this evening, represent people sort of on the edge of, of sort of being in disfavor with their government, which is not a good thing to be. Um, there is not free speech uh, in the way that we understand it. Uh, they are wrestling with Vietnam the way we are. Uh, and I would take just Bao Nien's, um, statement not only at the end of the introduction saying like Karl Marlantis that nobody talks about it there either but at the end that he lives in an apartment building and six young men are drafted and he's the only one who returns they've had to soul search about their strategies you know it isn't just us dropping bombs that's true but also they had a strategy where they would wear us down and that meant they would not, as Les One said, count the cost. So when we look at the body counts, which was a horrific metric that we invented and we could say, ah, oh, well, we're killing 10 of them to us. This is a tiny country. Three million people died. Everybody has a loss. It's way more. It's like, it's like Russia in the, in the Second World War. Everybody knows somebody who was killed. It's, 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 it's devastating. And so they are now nearly 80 million people. That would make them one of the largest, if not the largest country in Europe. 75% were born after the fall of Saigon. They're incredibly industrious and entrepreneurial. They love Americans. They're very curious about who we are. And um, I th there are opportunities there um, for us to learn about each other without sort of applying what our own political filter suggests would be there for true across the board. I'm not suggesting that you've done that, sir, but I'm, I'm just saying that we really, liberty is not being too sure we're right. And, and it's a very complicated story that we've, we've tried to tell. Uh, I'm going to just jump in Thank right you. quick with some, a question from Grand Junction. David Clapp, would I like to, the general to speak on, was there one thing that we should have or should not have done that would have affected the outcome of the war, if that's something you can touch on quickly? Uh, <clears throat> if we could have prevailed on the Saigon government to promote uh, officers based on their competence rather than their loyalty to the regime, it would have made a big difference because the typical South Vietnamese soldier fought very bravely and won, uh, not every battle, but won often enough. But the province-level chieftain on down, the generals, the colonels, were a disaster. And uh, that kind of leadership was exposed again and again. So had we wanted to win, we would have had had to lean pretty hard on, on the Saigon government to professionalize their officer corps. That sounds familiar today, too. Yes, sir, please. Uh, Identify my yourself. Name, my name is Joe Rook, and I worked about 40 years with veterans at the VA, heard horrible stories, and yet during your clips, I found myself closing my eyes at some of the tragedies and the horrors. So I wonder if you would share with me what you and your staff struggled with and how you went about deciding what to include and what not to include. That's, that's a wonderful question, sir. I think you've probably seen the worst of it in, in the scenes that you've seen. Um, as in all cases, the subtractive nature, as I was suggesting, is operative in this film. We've got lots worse stuff on the cutting room floor consciously. We wish to bring everyone along, and I can't think of anything more graphic than the assassination of, of Lem uh, by Luan during the middle of the Tet Offensive there that you saw not only in reverse in the introduction, but um, 
it, horrifyingly going forward, and we, we even deal with that photograph in subsequent moments in that same episode, a uh, few other moments. But uh, the same is true of the Civil War and World War II. Um, we want to have everyone watching, and we want it to be difficult, and at times to, to look away, perhaps, as I've had to do working on it, but not turn away completely. And um, we have to look at it, all of it. And as you see, you know, look at it from all sides, too. I mean, when the communists do a land reform that kills hundreds of thousands, we say that. When they massacre unarmed civilians, we say that. And we just don't hold feet to the fire um, kind of subjectively and, and in a kind of masochistic way. So was it a team discussion and, and a back and forth? Um, it, it is. It, there's a kind of um, unspoken rhythm that you get into and in how these things get structured and paced and then also the kind of decisions of what to show. And so you're, you're I live in New Hampshire and, and I, we, I use this all the time, we make maple syrup there and it takes 40 gallons of sap to make one gallon of maple syrup. And the process is pretty delicate, believe it or not, and pretty interesting, and the results are great. Um, Northern comfort, we call it. Um, <laughs> but, it, it but it requires 40 times the amount of material, and uh, there's lots of discussions that go on all the time about the efficacy of, of various things, not just for their graphic nature, but, but for other sorts of things, you know, and, and particularly with war when you want to make sure that you are at the very least exposing the reality of war. You can't sugarcoat a lot of stuff. And at the same time, you want to be able to speak about the civilian volunteers, which we do. You want to talk about the geopolitical table setting necessary to understand the French thing. You saw that the first episode is called Deja Vu. Well, the rest of the you know, hour and 20 minutes of that 90 minute episode proves beyond a shadow of a doubt all the stuff that happened to the French was going to happen to us too. And it's, it's pretty devastating also when you think about it, about the lesson. Go ahead, ma'am. Hello, my name is M.T. Casey, and I went to an all-girls high school, and I graduated in 1967, and I didn't know any boys that went to the service, and I really had no idea what was going on. But my question is, how did you find the Vietnamese people to interview, and how important it is to have their pictures from then and, us, and talking to them now? Well, you know, we treated the interviews with the Vietnamese the way we did with our American counterparts. There are more than 50 Americans, and they represent every kind of strata of American society and every sort of stripe, you know, of, of, of stuff from people who were, you know, still to this day, you know, very gung-ho about the war to people who knew from the beginning it was a mistake, and more importantly, every shade in between. We had extraordinary access to the country. Uh, one of our Marines, highly decorated Marine, was sort of haunted by the war and returned there and was instrumental in sort of hurting John McCain and John Kerry and Bob Kerry and others who had been Vietnam veterans to help push for normalization, and he spent the last two generations educating at Harvard many of the leaders of Vietnam and is there all the time, in, including right now. And so he introduced us to people that we hired a Vietnamese producer who we would just go out to veterans groups. Were you at the Battle of at Back? Were you at the Battle of Binh Ja? And get the same response as you would in Americans. And of course, we had a huge cultural and particularly language barrier, which we overcome overcame pretty quickly and within a couple questions it was the same thing. We asked General McPeak what music he liked, right? We asked them what music they liked. We played that music. Yo-Yo Ma and the Silk Road Ensemble did it. The, the opening of the Misty section is a, is a tune that General McPeak told us he was listening to and, and liking. While so, my guitar gently weeps. <laughs> you know, we've got, we've got a lot of that uh, in there and so what you find is um, war is and, and several of our Marines discuss this and others, you know, is a dehumanizing thing. You have to make the enemy a horrible 
subhuman in order to fight wars. Yeah. They did that to us. They called us Gakmai, American bandits, a horrific, you know, negative thing. We called them gooks and dinks and, you know, all the, all the derogatory things. But they are, in fact, as we are, in fact, human beings. And you can't imagine how bad I felt when I learned that half of those truck drivers were women. General McPeak was in our, is in our screening and watching the scene, that scene, and, and said, wait a second, uh, you know, really, you know? It's, it's really important to know how they suffered too. And they did. You know, just think, I mean. So terribly. How different is Baunin going home than the Union soldier or Confederate soldier coming home and fight, hadn't heard a word from him or somebody returning home from the Second World War. If you look at the end of that series, you know, it's the same emotion, right? You, We're glad you're alive. And, and, and the thing is, you know, there's a famous scene in The Merchant of Venice called the Rialto scene in which Shylock the Jew is arguing at his humanity. He wishes to be taken at the same level as everyone else. He is not the subhuman. And have I not eyes, organs, senses, dimensions, affections, fed by the same food, subject to the same diseases? You know, this is... This is what we do. You, you should see in our last episode that the reconciliation that takes place between American soldiers that go back and Vietnamese uh, soldiers, North Vietnamese regulars or Viet Cong guerrillas. It's, you know, you, you wish human beings would skip to the reconciliation part, I, I but will they say, will not. We have, yes, go ahead, please. We have about 10 minutes left and we have lots of questions. So if we could make them very pointed as well as the answers yep. for us up here, then we'll move ahead. Guilty. I have a brief 10-part response. <laughs> Let's see, I think we're over here next. Uh, do you think the people of Vietnam will be able to see this film at some point? Will the government allow it? And if so, how do you think that might affect their view of this war? Well, we make, as we do in public broadcasting, a Spanish language version in addition to the English language version. We've also spent many, many months and taxed the resources of, of many people uh, in both countries uh, producing a Vietnamese version, which will, will be available. And at this particular moment, the Vietnamese government does not block PBS.org. And we are hoping it will be possible. Thank you. For them yes, to sir. see it. They're very excited about, by it. Yes, my name is uh, Joe Portnoy. I'm a, a wishful filmmaker, and I was hoping that you could talk about how you found your signature style and uh, if you have any advice for filmmakers. You know, uh, style is merely the authentic application of techniques and every craftsperson or artist has at their disposal lots of techniques and if they're employed authentically to themselves, they become a technique, I mean, I mean a style. You can walk into a room of paintings by Cezanne and know it's him because they all feel the same way. And, and that's what it is. And each person has to develop their own style. They can imitate others until they find something. And, and of course, everyone's style is, of course, built on the backs of other styles that you riff off of. So, you know, the advice is so, it sounds like such platitudes, but it's kind of to thine own self be true, a kind of Socratic, who am I? Do I have something to say? Is, is, is this what I should be doing? And I was very fortunate to know at 12, I wanted to be a filmmaker, at 19, that I wanted to be a documentary filmmaker, and at 22 in American history. It's very helpful to have that kind of certainty there. But, that's not the case necessarily for everybody else. So the other thing is what I learned more important than anything was just perseverance, you know, that's I'm, it. I'm getting the signal that I'm supposed to wrap, but I know they don't have one of those hooks, so I'm going to allow two more questions here and there. <laughs> Recognizing that there are so many threads to weave into this wonderful tapestry which we are going to be able to experience two threads I have had personal experience with, and I'm wondering if when you encountered those threads, you explored them at all to be part of the film or knew that the story was more complicated than mm -hmm. you wanted to include. 
uh, the orphans of the Vietnam War, many of whom are adoptees in our communities, and the refugees from South Vietnam. So both of those are part of the denouement, very briefly mentioned, but a hugely important part. When the fall of Saigon takes place in our film about halfway through the 10th episode, there is a kind of accelerated arc to the end of it, which means that many important topics that you could open up and do entire films on, threads that would themselves put you know, be, could be woven together into magnificent tapestries in their own right, stand alone, you so, sort of have to run through. But I would love to have the conversation with you uh, after you've seen the whole thing and whether you feel that was a mistake to leave them out. Big debates happened about that. Not leave them out, but make them just kind of a minor uh, mention. It had to do with Aristotelian poetics, believe it or not, how stories are told. Uh, as much as it does our interest or lack thereof in that, and we certainly had an interest for both those things. I think you'll see. Thank you. And our last question, please. My name is Len Ackland. I was a civilian in Vietnam in 1967-68. Fifty years ago, I was living in Hue. Um, and I was intrigued by General McPeak's uh, comment about fighting on the wrong side. And I'd like to ask you, uh, Ken Burns, uh, two things related to that. You used the, the number from 1945 to 1975 for the Vietnam War. Now, 1945, end of World War II, the French came back with American support. So it was the French Indochina War, typically, up until 1954. Um, although 80% by 1952, 80% of the French war cost was being paid by the Americans. So I was curious to know how you broke that down and whether you would respond to General McPeak's um, comment. Uh, my question is, do you think that the United States should have been on either side in that war? It's complicated and... Um... <laughs> You'll, um, you'll see that, uh, that when you say 1945, you say the French come back. There's, a, there's a, an American dimension to that story that is hugely important that I would invite the viewers to see rather than have me recapitulate at this, the last question. Um, throughout the film, many um, people archivally that is to say, are no longer living, or people in our interviews refer to it, as General McPeak did, as very much like the American Revolution. And so we had a soldier going off the war saying, but of course, if I were a Vietnamese, I'd be on the side of the Viet Cong, because it's like the British and, and the colonists. And so there's lots of disconnects. And what, rather than come down and say, this is, we have presented something that I think, as I've said, and it's not a joke, it is really, really complicated. I don't, I'm not disagreeing with General McPeak at all, although there'll be other moments in the film when you'll feel the opposite of what you feel in, in, in those moments, and that's why we need to talk about Vietnam, because it can't, there cannot be this ironclad theory that holds across the board there is no single truth in war. I want to remind you, wait, hold your applause just one moment, we'll thank him. I want to remind you, you can start watching this on September 17th, that's a Sunday, at 7 p.m. on Rocky Mountain PBS. And you can go right now to rmpbs.org and see trailers and see local stories, Colorado stories, of people who were involved um, both as soldiers in the war, but uh, also as protesters, as refugees. And those stories, I, I commend them to you. Also, there is a, a link to a video. M many of you may have heard of Dr. Vincent Harding, who was a friend of Martin Luther King Jr.'s, who wrote uh, Dr. Harding, who was teaching here 
here at the University of Denver um, until his recent death, wrote the speech that King gave about Vietnam, and you can see a 50th anniversary commemoration of that at our website. So thank you all for coming. Will you please join me in thanking General McPeak and Ken Burns for our wonderful time. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you.